From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We're joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deccant. Most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. Welcome back to Longtime Conspiracy Realist. Thank you always uh, for tuning in, folks. What a week we have had. Uh, we have returned uh, the three musketeers, I almost said mouseketeers, the three <laughs> musketeers are, are back live and direct in full effect uh, with a very interesting episode. But before we get to that, we have um, we have an important announcement. Uh, there is something big that just happened in the world of music journalism. Oh, Ben, that's very kind. Of you. I appreciate it. Yeah, I was out uh, last week um, for a little family vacation. But before that, uh, I was in New York doing a launch event for a podcast that uh, I've been working on um, for about the last uh, year and a half or so about the Rolling Stones uh, classic record Exile on Main Street and the tour uh, that accompanied it, which is kind of the first sort of like template for like the big rock and roll tour. And it's it's not just like a rah-rah you know, rock stars are cool podcast. It has a lot of elements of true crime. It has a lot of elements of dealing with addiction. Uh, it's just like kind of a human story that just happens to star some very larger than life individuals in the form of, you know, the uh, real life Rolling Stones. Um, we worked with Jordan Runtog, friend of the show, and myself, along with uh, Michael Alder June, um, worked with two uh, fellas who actually were on the tour and spent time with the Rolling Stones in the south of France during the recording of Exile on Main Street in a basement of a rented mansion known as Villa Nelcott, where all kinds of crazy stuff uh, went down involving Keith Richards and drugs and guns and uh, debauchery of every stripe. And the tour really delivered a lot of that stuff that um, was involved in making this incredible album. Um, so it actually is out already. It comes out on Wednesdays uh, on on the iHeartRadio app or Apple Podcasts or wherever you get podcasts. Um, it's got a lot of original music that's composed by myself and uh, June um, and just some really cool archival tapes uh, of the Rolling Stones from that era, courtesy of uh, one of our um, our main voices, uh, Robert Greenfield, who was a fantastic journalist, kind of you'd call him like a gonzo journalist, I guess, in the spirit of a Hunter S. Thompson, who was embedded on the tour and spent a bunch of time in the south of France as well, along with his buddy, uh, Jordan describes as PR Supremo, Gary Stromberg, who represented a entire jukebox of uh, the 70s biggest artists, um, mainly from England, including Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd, and of course, the Rolling Stones. And uh, he also produced Charles Manson's demo tape, which uh, is a story that comes up, I think, around episode three. So I'll leave it at that, but really proud of it and really excited uh, to have it out there in the world. And and thanks for uh, giving me a chance to plug something that I'm doing. That I'm doing uh, outside the pod congratulations awesome. yeah check it out folks uh it's called again. the stone touring party by the way yes, stone, the name stone, of it. Yeah. stone's touring party is what it's called you can get it anywhere you get your podcasts i just went to the beach <laughs> <laughs> you went to the beach matt well how was it we. how was it it was a beach it was we <laughs> and you avoided uh you avoided that uh super rare a uh, weird disease that we just we just saw got a person ah, another person in Georgia. That, it's an amoeba that only exists in fresh water. I was in salted water. There we go. <laughs> no zip lining. I've heard zip lining can also be a recipe for flesh eating bacteria. There was a, there's a story. It's a way here. to get kicked off bachelor shows. That's for also sure. true. <laughs> I just remember years ago there was a story about a young woman in Georgia who who got injured zip lining and then got like a really really horrific flesh eating bacteria that caused her to to believe having a leg amputated. Like I'm sorry, I'm not remembering Ooh. the details of the story, but it is very dangerous to uh, to be in fresh water. They call it fresh, but it's often and quite fe fetid is that a word no fe mm -hmm. fe water fe can be fetid yeah that bad bad news water uh, if it if it's stagnant it can go bagnant 
That's that's how you remember that one. Hmm. Tell them the demonic there. Uh, also, uh, shout out to you guys. Uh, very much missed uh, Matt off air. You and I were singing "Welcome Back." The uh, what is that? The Mister Cotter theme Mr. song. Mister Cotter. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, Wait, right. it's it, it's from that era of sitcoms where the theme song is just. I'll say it so much better than the actual show. I miss you know that what time. I mean? So many yeah. bangers. It was a golden time. Mm-hmm. And for ufologist, last week was a golden time, uh, quite a quite a precipitous, precarious time. On July 26, 2023, just a few days ago, as we record, a former military intelligence officer turned whistleblower, whom we mentioned in a previous strange news segment named David Grush, joined two other U.S. veterans to testify before Congress. Their claim? Nothing about the VA. Nothing about, like, tax policies or culture wars or anything like that. These three guys, who are extensively vetted, uh, they claim UFOs or UAP are real. Further, they claim the military-industrial complex has incontrovertible proof of this reality and that these factions of the U.S. government are actively hiding these revelations not just from Congress, but from the American public as well. Here are the facts. First, I I think we need to do our own kind of meta disclosure, right? Oh, well, I guess first let's say we've discussed the other two witnesses who were there. David Fravor, we've discussed his sighting quite a bit. It's the the Tic Tac video. We talked about Jeremy Corbell uh, extensively about that sighting a long time ago. And then we also talked about, oh gosh, Ryan Graves is his name. Another a Navy pilot that witnessed some weird stuff. And gosh, man, we'll get into it. But his description of what a UAP looks like is so, <laughs> gosh, it just makes your mind real. He was, he was highlighted in High Strange, Payne Lindsay's show about the Mm -hmm. UAP subject. And both of those guys, Jeremy Corbell and Payne Lindsay, were in attendance. Yes, uh, with at, at Congress, we we spoke with them both briefly. Uh, they attended this hearing from the House Intelligence Committee or a subcommittee of the House Intelligence Committee, and uh, Jeremy was there along with the legendary journalist George Knapp, who was his co-host for the show Weaponized. Uh, those two guys have been working extensively with David Grush leading up to this. Uh, at this point, folks. We don't know any more than the rest of the American public. If you've watched the hearings, we also have not been in a skiff and heard David tell us, you know, all the stuff he can't say in public. Uh, Can can we talk about that use of the word skiff? Because before we get into this, guys, I want a Republican representative to be my new best friend. His name oh. is Tim Burchett, Burchett, Burchett. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. This dude, uh, the way he interacts with the uh, other congressmen, the way he interacts <laughs> with people he's interviewing, uh-huh. people who are just like, he, I think he called out Jeremy Corbell and George Knapp in the audience. He did. He did. He did. <laughs> And you can see and the whole hearing on C-SPAN, too. But yeah. just the way he's like, he's just mm-hmm. so calm, just real, mm-hmm. just, you know, laid back about everything. I was like, dang, mm-hmm. I like this guy. How's your mom like, and them? <laughs> McConaughey type figure. But wait, wait, so a skiff, like what was like, like a like a dinghy? Like a, like a small boat? What are we talking here? Yeah, a skiff. We'll, we'll get to it today. But a, a skiff is an acronym for a sensitive compartment compartmentalized or compartmented information facility, SCIF. It basically means a secret room, uh, an, uh, a leak-proof room in okay. all senses of the word. So kind of like yeah. a dinghy, <laughs> an information dinghy. Yeah. That no intelligence operation has any listening devices in whatsoever, for sure. Yeah, for definitely. Sure. Wink. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if you've... Uh, no, appro- no unapproved <laughs> devices, maybe, Matt. Um, if you have been in a skiff before, you know that they're not uh, they're not super duper fancy pants. Uh, funny story about skiffs. I don't know how many people know this, but they look maybe not like dinghies, but like dingy 
office buildings because security is so tight in those things that the people who work in them often have to take turns cleaning them. Gosh. And, <laughs> and nobody nobody wants to be like, I just saved the world and no one can know. And now I got to take out the trash. Are there it's at tough. least snacks? I mean, got, come on, throw us a bone here, guys. I, I you know what? Um, I don't know if you can take the snacks in the skiff. You can definitely eat outside. Okay. Uh, Fair enough. That seems reasonable. Yeah. I I'll guess. go. I'll go. <laughs> okay, good. We'll, we'll pencil you in. Uh, so the three of us, like you folks, are working with freely available information from any number of sources and institutions. And while the three of us, like you, have heard various whispers and rumors and conjecture, we're cleaving to the bare facts this evening. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in the wind. More seems to be on the way, but isn't that always the case with disclosure? Uh, and we have, we have, as I said earlier, spoken briefly with uh, both Jeremy and Payne about this most recent development. And we've also spoken, to your point, Matt, we've spoken with them extensively in previous interviews for this show. And do check out those interviews when you have a chance, because I, I, I listened back to, uh, oh, gosh, our very first interview with Jeremy. Was that Patient 17 we were talking about? I think that's right. Yeah. And I think it holds up. Yeah. Uh, so this hearing in Congress comes as the culmination of a long, long process. A lot of people first heard about this in the United States uh, due to an article released by The Debrief. However, uh, Jeremy and George, from what we understand, have been talking with retired Major David Charles Grush uh, far before this. Anyway, in June of this year, Grush goes public and he makes some pretty amazing, or depending on how you look at it, pretty alarming claims. And he, and he doesn't really equivocate. Yeah, well, let's talk about his experience just to give him a little credibility here. He served 14 years as an intelligence officer in the air force. He, I believe he got to the rank of major, at least that's what he says in his statement officially to Congress. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, he also worked at the national geospatial intelligence agency. And I can't confirm this, but he says he reached GS 15 civilian level, which he describes as high ranking, basically like a, a full colonel. bird colonel. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, you know, th this this guy is not what you would typically think of when you think of a whistleblower. You know, usually when someone comes out and like, uh, you know, um, speaks to truth to power or leaks some information, there's an immediate attempt to kind of uh, smear them to some degree or to remove their credibility. But it's almost kind of there's no point with this guy because he's just so dang legit. Right. Well, well. <laughs> he states, he stated while he was uh, not on the stand, what do you call this? While he's giving testimony, he stated mm -hmm. very, let's say vaguely, that he has been under threat professionally and personally by people who are attempting to retaliate against him. Um, it, like former higher ups, he says that he worked with, but he cannot disclose specifics for that in the same way that he's being extremely careful about giving specifics about the national defense aspects of what he's coming forward to say, right? That's one of the kind of frustrating things about this. He's, it appears that he's doing everything in his power to stay out of prison, but he wants the public to know that this stuff is real. He just can't give us any of the specifics because he would literally go to jail. Right, right. Because he is moving through the appropriate reporting channels and only after those channels, those checks and balances failed, did he go public. So right now, this guy is doing the correct thing. And you can obviously tell, uh, you can obviously tell that these folks have been driven to this. This is not their first resort. They are enacting or they're following through with what they feel is their duty, uh, not just to the American public, but probably to humanity overall. Here are the claims with all those caveats. Here are the public claims. We'll get into all the stuff we just foreshadowed in a moment. But the public claims that Grush makes are one UFOs or Unidentified Anomalous Phenomena, UAP, as they're sometimes called, 
they're super real and they are not uh they're not human in origin and then second he says furthermore i know they're real because uncle sam and likely other governments possess physical proof and I mean, your mind immediately, I mean, me, not your mind, but my mind immediately goes to Independence Day where you've got some like, you know, lab where you've got these, you know, reptile lizardy things in tanks. You know, it's probably not as elaborate as all that. It could well be just some small, you know, um, remnant or some piece of uh, biological material. But, that, you know, th- this is enough to make your mind go wild. Well, yeah. And, but Grush, in that first point, Grush is very specific that it's essentially remnants of technology with the physical evidence. But then he goes further, right? He does, Matt. He does go further and uses a very tricky, possibly legally safe phrase. Uh, he says Uncle Sam also possesses what he describes as, quote, non-human biologics. Now, at this point, we might all ask ourselves with some validity, (laughs) what on or off Earth is a non-human biologic? Let's not stand on ceremony. We're going to pause for a word from our sponsors, and then we're diving in. Here's where it gets crazy. Aliens are real. That's what you're saying. There, well, there, there's something that is not human that humans cannot replicate that is out there and it's real. And that's kind of been the way that this conversation has been going ever, you know, for a little bit now, even, you know, with the government kind of coming out and saying, like, we've, we, we've got these things that we can't fully explain with things that we know about. But we're going to stop short of saying what you just said, Ben. Right. But this is it seems to be heading in a direction that's going to force them to have to say something a little more specific. Should we talk about biologics? Like, what what is biologics? Don't know that word. Certainly never heard it in that, in that form before. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. seems made up. Just well, because he didn't he yeah. didn't use the phrase biological entity or non human no. entity or you know a creature. It, 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 it's referring to like systems, right? Like I would imagine like biological systems. Like if you're Maybe. talking about some things biologics, which again I'm not familiar with, I would usually think of just calling it biology. You're referring to a particular type of system like endocrine systems or or things the way like the tubes connect you know in particular species of living creatures right is that it could be blood it could be epithelial cells it could be um half of an alien body uh when we talked about this originally in the strange news segment we did uh we saw that he had stated to the debrief i believe it was it was either to the debrief or to weaponized that he saw things that looked as though they were corpses from motorcycle crashes uh, and that there were no complete cadavers is what I understand. But I I love that we're pointing out biologics because I I would argue that is a purposefully public friendly and very vague term. Any, any, (laughs) like anything that falls under the category of an organism would be a biologic, right? Like literally any piece of you as you're listening now, unless you are chat GPT. But non-human doesn't necessarily uh, unequivocally imply alien. It just means right. not human. It could be like a bear, you know, right. or like a, yeah. a, la- a land shark. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Is that a thing? Yeah. Guys, if there were bears piloting these dark gray cubes inside a clear sphere, I would, I would be so excited. Yeah, yeah I'm they can already climb badgers. trees. Yeah, I like the, you know it's true, and it could be plant matter, for example. It could mm-hmm. be a virus. It could be a worm that has hibernated in Siberia for untold thousands of years and then just woke back up, stretched, and started reproducing. That actually happened last week as well. <laughs> It's funny, Ben. I actually, before I, I, I had heard this term associated with the story, the first place I saw it was on a meme somebody posted, uh, which was just an image of the the plant from Little Shop of Horrors, and it just <laughs> said non-human biologics. Uh, and I was like, what does that mean? <laughs> but like, uh, that, that thing fits the bill for everything we're talking about. It's a plant and an alien. It's like an alien plant from outer space. 
that wants mm-hmm. to eat you. Needs oh, you to feed it. Mm-hmm. Maybe this is it for us, you guys. Maybe yeah, the maybe the fungal one. et uh, et thing is finally coming true. That's going to be a big takeover. Mm-hmm. There are fungus <laughs> among us. It's true. It's true. Uh, it all could also be, of course, um, we're looking very small things. It could also be bacteria, right? Uh, mm-hmm. And then the big question becomes. How do we scope in on that definition of non-human biologics? Is it something that can be disclosed publicly? Now, if you have watched these hearings, like uh, this hearing, like we have, uh, then you'll see that a great deal of the conversation with Grush specifically uh, goes back to him and uh, members of Congress, House representatives saying, well, we have to get into a skiff, into a secure room to have these classified discussions. So just like the, um, the previous disclosure hearing, um, we can understand how a lot of the public might think this is somewhat vague. And the argument there is that it is vague as a result of national security. But Grush doesn't go alone. There are, again, um, as you mentioned, Matt, there are three witnesses in total. Yeah, there are three. Can we just talk about how much that sucks that we can't know? We're not allowed to know. <laughs> There's somebody who's like, mm, sorry, you can't know. I mean, uh, we can't it, even talk about it. If it were up to them, we wouldn't know what we do know. And we wouldn't even be having this conversation. I mean, you know, it tracks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it I does mean, suck. There's, yeah. There's also, I was talking with, uh, with a couple of different folks offline about this. There are some. There are some distressingly and sadly valid reasons for this idea like if you had non-human technology and you knew that other countries probably had something like it something similar then you would have to realize if we're playing cold war mentality that you disclosing any conclusions you have about this stuff that counts as breakthrough research for rival countries. And yeah, that's a Cold War mentality, but we have to realize that a, if the cover up is true, then a lot of the people in charge of that cover up are these old school, you know, like war hawks. They have that Cold War mentality. Uh, so there's yeah. not. There's not an Ocasio Cortez or whatever for uh, the NRO, is what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess that makes sense. But I, rationally, my brain understands that. But it's still, it feels like the type of technology that's been described by these guys, that's been described by some other, I guess you would call them whistleblowers who have been coming forward lately about other things like <clears throat> Antarctica and a certain uh, <laughs> <clears throat> harp like thing that can be a directed <laughs> energy weapon. Um, it just feels like if we had that technology, we were aware of it. And rather than using it to maintain military might to, you know, enforce our will as a country and as an economic system across the entire globe, we could actually use it to fix the major problems the globe faces. And it, so it just, you know, I'm sorry, I don't mean to stick on this too much. It's just like, just kind of angry about it altogether. It's It's a great point. You know what I mean? It's a, it's a fantastic point. I had this, I've got this idea that keeps bumping around in my head where I'm thinking, okay, what if one aliens or extra dimensional entities are real and they have a bunch of cool technology and humans found it? What if all the stuff that humans can leverage is just stuff from the eighties and nineties that eighties and nineties kids think is cool? You know what I mean? Like, what if, what if that's where Surge the soda comes from? What if that's like the the big alien invention is Velcro? Or you know Jasta. what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I mean it's true, and it really does. Uh, you know, first of all, it makes you think of the whole idea of ho- the government holding back technology. You know, we've always talked Which about is that. True. How they definitely mm-hmm. will have the tech that isn't available to the public for sometimes many, many years. You know, uh, until even like with things like storage media. You know, and then the size it takes to to store data or whatever. That's always going to be available. Uh, larger, um, it, larger storage and smaller packages before it gets to uh, consumers, as is the case for computing and stuff like that. But like, what if these 
you know, whatever this is, whatever this represents in terms of like another um, species or another, you know, uh, I guess civilization, you know, how ahead are they <laughs> and what does that represent? And is that stuff to your point, Matt, that would be useful for us that could actually help people or help fix problems that have been caused by the government and, and industry and all of that. But instead of doing something with it, it's just being sat on for fear of, you know, endangering, quote unquote, national security, which seems really, uh, what's the word, not counterintuitive, but just certainly counterproductive. The idea of national security being more important than actually <laughs> making the nation safer from like in, in imminent threats, existential threats and things like that. Than securing the nation. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, yeah. The idea at the extreme is what if there is, um, a panacea for very common ailments, right? What if there is a way to repair environmental degradation? What if there is a way to provide limitless energy and clean water to the population? That's it. It's for me and for my money, if I'm a betting person and I am such a betting person, not really, uh, it's that <laughs> it's the power source. Because if, if, these things that have been that were described by Ryan Graves, one of the one of the Navy pilots there used to fly F-18s all around. If the, these again, cubes inside spheres can do what they can do and create a sphere of energy of some sort around them to function basically with, you know, defying gravity. That feels like a power source that could be utilized for a lot of different things they could probably eventually and pretty rapidly, depending on what types of materials are needed to produce it, it would replace the gasoline industry, which we all know is tied to the U.S. dollar, which we all know would be the end to a way of life, but would also perhaps, you know, lead towards this more utopian place on Earth. So it's just like you can see I can see maybe why something as simple as a power source would be so heavily guarded. Yeah, yeah. What's that song? Every new beginning comes from some other beginning's end. You what know? Is oh, closing time. Closing yeah. time. <laughs> for, for the planet. Yeah. yeah for, for, somewhere. For, the, for the bunker doors. That's what, that's what closing time is. Some guys is. in oh. JSOC are just getting hammered in a Pentagon basement looking at looking at this sphere of clean fusion energy and they're playing closing time and they're like, we got to save the dollar, though. Uh, <laughs> it's sort of like the idea that, oh, the, the government's been holding back a cancer cure or whatever because they're in bed with the pharmaceutical industry. And while I think our research, you know, and, and the research at large maybe doesn't show that exactly, I wouldn't put it past them. You know, g given the ability to hold something back in the interest of maintaining the status quo, like because we know how hard it was for the electric car to take off. We know that, that there were active moves to kill the electric car and other types of alternate energy. So why wouldn't how would this be any different? Certainly not like the government's going to come out and say, hey, guys, we made a deal with the aliens and now everyone gets free energy. No more utilities like that's just not how it works. It would be like a monthly service. If I know humans well, you know what I mean? You don't ever buy Netflix. You no, just no, that's right. It. it would be yeah. a, like a streamer. It would be, it would be yeah. like a subscription. Everything would be, yeah, the, the, uh, the <laughs> rental economy. Yeah, it's true. It does make me think we need to go back and look at some of the resource extraction over the past mm -hmm. like 40 years. 40 years, I think, is the timeline. Maybe, maybe a little bit longer. But like, Astute. look at. Look at the moves, because there's probably specific elements that were required to reconstruct this stuff if they've really so had it. 40 years for how long this stuff has been known. Is that what you're saying? Well, that I, would be the idea. Like the, the time horizon might extend a little bit further back. You'll hear you'll hear whispers in the various ufology communities that the one of the first modern craft recovered was uh via the Germans in the 30s. But again, there's no way to prove that. So yeah, That's if we really looked back, point. yeah, if we looked back and it was like, hey, there was a ton of this one material in Tunguska and now it's not there. You know what I mean? Or, you know, if if what if Wagner's moves in Niger recently are not about uranium? What if, what if they're about something else? I'm kidding. They're about uranium. Yeah, so, yeah, sl yeah. Slightly silly question, but like, 
I know, you know, obviously there are elements on the periodic table that were named after people, you know, that, that are still mm-hmm. living. Like, when was the last time we discovered a new element, you know? And, like, is there any sense that, like, you know, some new element that is discovered could well be from some other world? Wait, are there people still alive who have elements named Maybe after Maybe not. I'm, I'm just talking. I, I just know that, you know, there are more, quote, unquote, you know, the ones that are... That are out not there. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I wait, I'm just wait. I've got something, guys. What do you got? April 2010. Mm-hmm. Tennessee. Tennessee? Wait, <laughs> Tennessee only goes back to 2010? <laughs> yeah, that's what it says. Atomic number 117. Yeah. 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 How do I I I know the periodic table? I don't know their ages. I was just so okay. Well, nice job, Tennessee. <laughs> yeah. It's weird because it's between Oganison and was it Livermorium or Muscovium on the table? Um oh it's liver I think it's Livermorium, Tennessee, and Oganison. Um and <laughs> I can name them, but I definitely didn't know that. 2010. Yeah. So to that excellent point, there are quite possibly, as Bigelow claimed back uh, not too long ago, there are quite possibly elements out there that humanity has yet to experience, uh, yet to encounter. Uh, We know that especially when you get to the more dodgy part of the periodic table, there are elements that have only existed for like a couple seconds, you know, for a very short amount of time. And then, oh, let me do it right. Uh, Whatever. Paul, put it, put it a better pop perfect thank you uh so these we're talking about these possibilities and folks if you've tuned into the show over the years a lot of this is old beans to you because these are things that people have been talking about since since the 1940s probably at at the at the most recent right and possibly quite possibly far before then. If you get back into Vril theories and Thule society and all that hyperborean stuff, then you find that folks have always been asking these questions. The big challenge that these three witnesses at this most recent hearing have is to prove that they are credible, to prove that they are not running some kind of smoke and mirror psyop, which they have been accused of, by the way, by numerous critics. Uh, And so they, again, they exhausted all the other proper reporting channels by their own accounts, and they moved as a unit. So they show up, again, just a few days ago to Congress, and they have an in-depth conversation on public record Uh, We can talk about those witnesses right now. I think the one people hear the most about is probably Grush. Uh, We can confirm his background is legit. Uh, He has a clear record of service, like you said, Matt, more than a decade in the service. Every claim he has made outside of this one bracketed controversial thing, every other claim he has made about his background has been investigated. It has been verified. It's been corroborated by multiple sources. He is telling the truth. He is a decorated combat officer. Uh, he was active in the Afghan theater. Uh, like you said, Matt, NGA, he was at NRO as well, National Reconnaissance Office. And at no, and he's very clear that at no point has he personally encountered physical evidence corroborating his claims in that he has spoken to a lot of people and he's seen a lot of documentation, but he has never personally been, uh, he's never personally been in some great cavern of non-human biologics. He has never personally flown a black cube with a strange clearish energy (laughs) bubble surrounding it. Those are fun. Uh, really quickly, I just want to correct myself. I'm sort of just set the record straight. Seaborgium is a uh, an element that was named after a famous um, physicist named mm-hmm. Glenn T. Seaborg, who died in 1999. And then I also, in looking that up, uh, there apparently was some sort of resolution passed in the scientific community to not name elements after living scientists. So I think that might have been the last one. But anyway, just for, for, for parties, you know, so you can mm-hmm. be fun mm-hmm. like us. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about how David Grush got this information. Uh, He didn't see it, but he was on a mission, basically, from an employer 
to discover things, and oh boy, did he discover them. In 2019, David was asked to, quote, identify all special access programs and controlled access programs needed to, quote, satisfy our congressionally mandated mission, which is basically to gather all intel on the UAP issue. Nothing weird. You know what I mean? That's actually the motto of the NRO. <laughs> if you get one of the patches, it says NRO, nothing weird. Nothing weird? Nothing, nothing to really see odd. <laughs> <laughs> Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, but in that admission that he was on, he ended up interviewing dozens of people, I think 40 people with, who were witnesses to UAP phenomena, to things like this, to seeing, again, all the stuff he's stating craft or parts of craft and whatever non-human biologics are whatever that is uh but yeah that's and and so what we're saying is that he is doing his job he gets assigned this this mission which probably already knows is going to be sticky but when you have the job you have to do the job and the nro is actually a great organization to dig into data with with this line of investigation because uh, nothing weird, but a lot of what the NRO does is monitor global communications, satellite, and missile activity, right? They're super into saying, let's predict and prevent disaster if something is flying that we if something is out there and it's flying and we don't expect it to be there let's figure out what it is that's kind of the NRO's job or that's one piece of a very very large mission set so this like we're I think what we're saying is this guy is not some I I don't love the stereotype but he's not some tinfoil hat wing nut you know what I mean he's he's a professional like you said, Matt, over the course of four years, he speaks to tons of people and he's got the juice organizationally to ask them some serious questions. Oh, yeah. And there's not a wing nut on the panel there. Well, I mean, let's think about the Ryan Graves, who was, again, featured heavily on High Strange. He's in he goes on. He talks just about what he experienced, what other fighter pilots in his squadron saw and witnessed, and basically how no one talked about it after it happened. No superiors <laughs> came to discuss. Right. It was just like, oh, I guess that happened. And that was in 2014. And Ryan states that he and multiple other pilots experienced the same thing again and again and again, but just nothing happened. Because, again, everybody is a little scared, really scared to just go forward and say, hey, commanding officer, we saw this really weird thing uh, right at the entry point of our mission. It was literally on the same radar dot as our mission begin dot, basically. Uh, and it it's like the fifth time that this has happened. What's going on? Any ideas? And what, yeah. What's that line? It was either uh, Graves or Fravor, who we'll introduce in a moment, who said, uh, I don't know, Congressman. I, I, I get it. Like I told them, it got put in a file somewhere. I think it might be in a file somewhere, which is <laughs> classic Uncle Sam in a drawer. You mm. know, that's where those things belong. They might have said drawer. I can't re recall. But well, okay, yes, they, Fravor is the one who comes forward and says, "I was the basically the commanding officer of yes. my unit there, and mm -hmm. I didn't know what to say." Nobody told me anything. I like I'm sitting there trying to figure it out and we're all just clueless and weirded out by this whole thing. There's and no we procedure. Just gotta, yeah. And you just got to kind of put in the back of your mind like, well, that happened. <laughs> right. So we're uh, so the second gentleman, uh, the one who actually opens up uh, the testimony here is a veteran U.S. Navy pilot retired now in private industry named Ryan Graves. Uh, his background is likewise legitimate, uh, and he describes aerial maneuvers that are currently, so far as he can state, beyond the capabilities of all officially acknowledged U.S. aircraft or human aircraft that he is aware of. And he's very clear about that too. That's what I respect about these guys. They're very, they're very clear when there is something that they can't say for sure. 
Well, folks like this, whether we call it a specific type of training, I guess, uh, in diplomacy, you know, or media training. But, I mean, there are ways that you cover your butt, you know, when you're talking to a governing body, you know, or, or like Congress. It's, it's, it's not something that you or I, maybe we would a little more than the average bear just from paying attention to this kind of stuff. But in general, they're going to conduct themselves much differently than, than a civilian. Non-human biologics. It's hilarious. I mean, it's, right. it's, it, it's only hilarious because it is so vague, but it also is like odd, isn't it? Does the term biologics, it's, it's like, uh, it, it baffles me. Yeah, I, I looked up the definition. FDA has a different definition. Um, the definition that you're going to find in the dictionary is not super helpful. So I skipped it. Uh, it's like. Yeah, it's medicine. It seems right. like what largely yeah. it's referring to. To like it's a pharma vaccines term. and so yeah. on. Yeah. Uh, so did and, he kind of goof? No, like, uh, I don't think so. He re- so there's the, this is like some, but why why is there nothing uh, even close to what this is what he's using this word to communicate? I think it's a feature, not a bug. Okay, I think, there, I think there maybe go. maybe there was some legal calculus behind that because this is deep water. You know, you're talking to Congress, so. Um, and again, we haven't talked with these folks directly. Uh, we're just using public information, to your point, Noel, biologics. To me, it feels like it is a purposefully chosen term. Uh, and a lot of that might just be what can and cannot be disclosed to the public, to the 300 million plus people here without a security clearance. Guys, can we restate quickly what Ryan Graves said? Uh, because we're we're going to talk, we just kind of mentioned it as these maneuvers, but mm-hmm. if I think if we can just get a little bit of what they saw, it would be awesome. This is Ryan Graves describing a 2014 incident when he and three other pilots are taking part in a 2v2 fighter jet training exercise and what they encountered. In 2014, I was an F-18 Foxtrot pilot in the Navy Fighter Attack Squadron 11, the Red Rippers. And I was stationed at NAS Oceana in Virginia Beach. After upgrades were made to our jet's radar systems, we began detecting unknown objects operating in our airspace. At first, we assumed they were radar errors. But soon, we began to correlate the radar tracks with multiple onboard sensors, including infrared systems, eventually through visual ID. During a training mission in Warning Area Whiskey 72, 10 miles off the coast of Virginia Beach, Two F-18 Super Hornets were split by a UAP. The object, described as a dark gray or a black cube inside of a clear sphere, came within 50 feet of the lead aircraft and was estimated to be 5 to 15 feet in diameter. The mission commander terminated the flight immediately and returned to base. Our squadron submitted a safety report, but there was no official acknowledgement of the incident and no further mechanism to report the sightings. That's a heck of a claim to make to Congress because this is, again, This is a person who has a set of skills that most people don't have. This guy, this guy is a professional military pilot and was for many years. And that means that this person is far more likely than the average badger to be able to identify things in the sky, right? And knows how to use all the instrumentation aboard the craft that he is flying. And is also claiming that this was corroborated by his colleagues. That story is nuts. A dark gray cube inside a clear sphere. Shadows of the Borg. You know what I mean? Hashtag Star Trek was right, baby. Yeah, well, and it might be complete coincidence, but the fact that it's sitting on the same little place where the radar blip is for the fighter pilots to enter the airspace where their training is going to begin, but it's sitting right on top of it. So you literally don't even notice that it's there if you're looking at your radar because it's as though you're, you know, it's almost like you're, again, I use the word mission start because I'm thinking about it like a gamer or something. This is how, this is the way to get into the level, right? It's the only way in. You can only enter through this space and there's this unidentified thing just sitting there. Good Mm -hmm. golly. Yeah. And a lot of, another Big part of, as amazing as this description sounds, another big part of Graves' testimony, as well as Fravor's, uh, concerns the stigma around self-reporting of UAP in the armed services and with commercial pilots as well. In Later on in his statement, 
uh, he says uh, he talks a little bit about Americans for Safe Aerospace, which is a military pilot led nonprofit organization focused on UAP. And they talk to commercial pilots, too. Here's a brief clip from his statement where he says, what commercial pilots tell us can defy belief, often beginning with an apology like, I apologize. I realize this will sound crazy. And the story goes again and again, per these, uh, per these men's experience, they feel that there will be retaliation or it can impact your career if you are just being honest. And, and that's like just saying, hey, I saw something anomalous, not saying, hey, I saw an alien, just saying the instruments and the training didn't teach us what this is. And you shouldn't be punished for being honest about that kind of stuff. No, not at all. And another part of that testimony is about how, especially um, commercial airline pilots, as you said, Ben, have no idea how to use evasive maneuvers for these things. If you're in a 747, <laughs> what do you do right. if it's in your flight, <laughs> flight path? Because some of the Aww. fighter pilots... <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, fucking weird-ass thing. Uh, oh, shit. Oh, sh- uh, we've <laughs> Sorry. got a uh, TikTok. Uh, pause the beverage service. Uh, Cross check. <laughs> no, but but really, like the, it's dangerous. What what they were testifying is that there is a real and present danger to anyone flying in the skies, right? Not mm-hmm. just military fighter jet pilots, but <laughs> Delta pilots. Right. There are a lot of people. Up in the sky, right? And this this is a concern that is seconded or thirded, I should say, by the next witness, uh, Marine, retired U.S. Navy commander, David Fravor. Uh, he is likewise legit. He talks in depth about that infamous Tic Tac episode uh, or the encounter. And he states that he and three fellow military pilots just as well trained spotted a white tic tac shaped object in 2004, hovering below their jets and just above the Pacific ocean. And as, as pointed out earlier, he's the commanding officer, right? Which means that people are supposed to report this to him. And then he's going, where do I report this? Uh, it's scary stuff. He also says he describes how it doesn't look like it should be able to fly. That stood out to me, right? Like it has no discernible means of propulsion, nothing that humans understand to be necessary to make something get in the air and stay there for a little while. Yeah. And I hate to be so unspecific here about this, but he states that some of the sensors that you're able to see the afterburners on a military jet or something like that, where the heat basically is being ejected to achieve propulsion in the air. They didn't sense anything like that, which again leads you down the pathway of, oh man, this is some kind of anti-gravity thing. Oh boy. (laughs) Oh geez, Rick. What if they find out? Uh, So he, he also says this thing vanished. It reappeared seconds later, 60 miles away. Uh, this, this stuff defies rational explanation, given the information, again, these world-class experts have. So, of course, well, it's And Fravor be- says, uh, he, just so Ben, he, Fravor describes it as, quote, far beyond our material science that we currently possess. Stood out to me, too, man. Yeah, he's, he's also saying there's no... Um, that it, this stuff is real and it is vastly superior to any military tech he is aware of. Mm, that's sort of where our whole conversation started uh, in this episode, I think, where you got folks with this kind of pedigree saying that kind of stuff. It's hard not to be worried that, that it's the truth. Right. Yeah. And that's one of the big concerns, you know, or that's the that's the real. Dare I use the pun, the wordplay, that's the real on the ground concern. Right. Is what does what does this mean for a large city? Right. What what does this mean for um, command and control of U.S. airspace? What does it mean for force projection? Uh, The 
that when Graves is speaking, he says, he name checks this specifically. He says, attack uh, squadron VFA 11 saw some inexplicable sh- between 2014 and 2015. Uh, and it was, it was following an upgrade to their radar system. They had the best radar at the time, and they started seeing these unknown objects. Tale as old as time, unfortunately. They were initially dismissed as software glitches. You know what I mean? We got some new upgrades. We might have some kinks to work out, uh, but they corroborated everything seven ways to Sunday, and we see that the claims grow more and more astonishing as the hearing continues. I, I suggest we pause uh so we can take our spacecraft out around the block let the sponsors speak up and then uh return with some of the more notable claims what do you guys think pew pew we've returned so grush claims that the effort to investigate and analyze and capture this stuff is above congressional oversight and bankrolled by, and this is a quote, a misappropriation of funds. In other words, black bag stuff where Ah. Congress and therefore the U.S. public doesn't know what they're actually buying. It's the old sap ruse, right? We talked about this. (laughs) Special access programming. Mm -hmm. You make it sound so sexy. Yeah. Uh, So Yeah, like there was this one moment where a uh, representative, a Democrat from Florida named Jared Mouskowitz says, uh, quote, does that mean that there is money in the budget that is set to go to a program, but it doesn't and it goes to something else? <laughs> no, no, I'm just joking. Grush said, quote, yes, I have specific knowledge of that. And then he said, you know, also, I can't tell you because it's classified because national security and uh, sorry. <laughs> What, is subtweeting a classified thing against the law? Like, uh, What's a subtweet? Subtweets where you sort of like, uh, you sort of shade somebody on Twitter, or I guess it's now it's called X, well, um, but you don't name them by name. You know, you don't actually give details, but you sort of like say something that if you know, you know, kind of. It's like um, vague she, booking. Vague booking. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, <laughs> like, just again, I'm sorry to be so Gen Z about this. Um, maybe that's not even Gen Z. What am I talking about? Who am I to dare claim to be of that set? Uh, but like these people aren't breaking the law, right? They're, they're going way uh, well out of their way to make sure they're not breaking the law. And they're being asked to testify before Congress, but they're not. Are they have they been subpoenaed? Are they in trouble? Like, I just want to understand a little bit of the big picture stuff. It sounds to me like they've been targeted behind the scenes, but on paper, above board, everything's OK. According to Grush. Yeah, yeah, they're you're you're absolutely right. Noel. they are not subpoenaed. They are there of their own free will. They have volunteered to come forward. Um, but. Grush in particular has alluded to retaliatory actions taken against him and his family. But, but again, also what I was getting out of the top of the show is the pedigree of these individuals is, is, is of such a high caliber that it would almost look foolish for the government to try to slander them. Whereas other whistleblowers, there will be an active public relations campaign to kind of dump on them. In advance, you know what I mean? It doesn't seem like that's happening exactly, which I think is what makes this sort of an interesting situation. Yeah, it's tough to, again, it's tough to know because um, in the hearing, Grush says that he cannot discuss the specific retaliatory measures that he does describe as brutal. Uh, He can't discuss it in the public sphere. So the implication then is that um, he has what we would call actionable intelligence on this, but that he cannot legally expose himself to slander, libel, et cetera. Um, That's, it's a puzzle. And frankly, it's a puzzle that we can't solve unless we know more, Uh, which is why we had to say at the very top that we're working with publicly available information. And, um, well, I believe, yeah, I believe Grush says and states in that testimony that he has an investigation into the actions taken against him 
that's True. ongoing. And that's one of the, like, legally you can't say because there's an investigation that will lead to a lawsuit probably with, you know, with him <laughs> as the as the person who's uh, pressing charges against somebody. Yeah, not commenting on an ongoing investigation. Yeah, 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 100%. Uh, there's also an interesting thing where he says, he's asked about extraterrestrials, and he says, I prefer to use the term non-human to keep it open. Uh, and and then there's there's another notable claim, which I think is, you know what, you can be an absolute skeptic, you can be an absolute true believer, but you have to agree with Graves' point this at least this one point he makes in the hearing, which is very well put. He says, look, if we're not briefing military pilots on how to react to UAP, whatever you might conclude those things are, then we're they're not going to be prepared to respond appropriately, which is a great it's a great point. You know what I mean? How like you need to have a clear set of procedures, order of operations for these things. Well, yeah, and pilots in the past have been told to ignore uh, those little weird blip glitches that you're seeing that, you know, the pilots now know are UAP, but they've been told by higher-ups to just ignore them, which Grave states is a huge problem and puts a massive hole in the defense capabilities of U.S. Navy fighter pilots, because if you're ignoring things on your radar, you who knows what you're ignoring? What if it's something completely different? Maybe it's an enemy that's taking advantage of the fact that you are you've been told to ignore it. Mm -hmm. Or maybe maybe um, it's a it's a malfunction. And if you ignore a malfunction <sighs> on a craft, then <laughs> it's going to it's going to bring you down real quick. On several mm -hmm. levels. Uh, so these guys also have a, there's almost a laundry list toward the end of several disturbing questions. When asked whether they would have been able to protect their craft and crew from whatever it is they saw in the sky, both pilots say categorically no, they would not be able to engage. When asked whether these UAP exhibit interest in nuclear tech, Grush pauses for a second. And then replies in the affirmative. Does it say anything else? And then when asked whether he had knowledge of people being injured, which we assume to mean physically injured by UAP, he replies in the affirmative. And again, this is all caveated with a lot of um, a, a lot of admission that he can't say much else. And Grush also gets asked if anyone has been murdered to cover up the UAP phenomena. And he says, he, he responds in what I would say is very much like the affirmative, but as though, but says that he can't speak to it. And he has provided that information in his complaint that he put forward. Mm -hmm. And that's the complaint uh, that he believes triggered some of the retaliatory action. Mm -hmm. But, but also of course, nothing happens in a vacuum. The Pentagon is part of this and the spokesperson for the all domain anomaly resolution office so for all of us playing along at home that's adaro uh, this, uh, I, they, uh, it's just aro they they put all domain together oh that's they don't right even they have the hyphen the uh so it's just aro um they never give you the d <laughs> so so their spokesperson said Investigators have not discovered, quote, any verifiable information to substantiate claims that any programs regarding the possession or reverse engineering of extraterrestrial material have existed in the past or exist currently. Yep. Not a big surprise. It sounds about right. It's not like the spokesperson for the Pentagon is going to come out and say, LMAO, good game. <laughs> <laughs> you got us, though. And this statement, of course, uh, it does not specifically say anything about black bag projects, you know, uh, suppressed tech. Uh, it doesn't say anything in short about UFOs that are not suspected of being extraterrestrial objects. So is it possible that just like with stealth bombers in the days of yore, uh, the Pentagon has some, some kind of secret craft? 
flying around and they know what it is, it's totally possible. They're just being so coy about it, man. They're, they're playing hard know. to get. They really are. <laughs> so, I don't know. Well, and they're not cocky the only, little devils. Well, the RO, they're not the only people to respond. Although there was one other notable RO response, and that is from Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick who I believe he's the director of the all domain anomaly resolution office. And he basically stated that this whole thing, this whole hearing was just insulting to him and his crew and everybody who works with him, Uh, which, you know, it's fine. It was a memo that got leaked on X, some new social media thing. Well, you can also understand the frustration too, right? Because again, Mm -hmm. people, People feel that their credibility may be at stake for talking about this stuff. I mean, NASA also comes out and they say, look, we're NASA. We are always trying to find life somewhere else. And so far, no, we have not found any credible evidence of extraterrestrial life. And they said, there's no evidence that UAP are inherently extraterrestrial. But NASA's a little bit nicer. They're saying, we're still exploring the solar system. Guys, it's kind of our thing. Uh, and we are hoping to answer fundamental questions, including whether we're alone in the universe. So a little bit more diplomatic on NASA's side. Did you guys hear about the Falcon 9 uh, rat situation? Falcon Did you guys 9 hear about rat? This? Oh, no. (laughs) Okay. This is a social media phenomena right now that I've been looking at. I haven't analyzed fully yet, but there's supposed footage, I think from 2021, I may be wrong, where there was a Falcon 9 second stage rocket, you know, in uh, pretty much in space at this point, once you're on second stage with a Falcon 9 rocket, where there's a rat crawling around like on the exterior There's a shot, you know, one of those cameras that they have mounted to the exterior of the rocket. There's like a rat that you can visibly see walking around on the rocket. The implication being that the whole thing is green screened and nothing's actually moving. There's a rat in a studio somewhere. Okay. (laughs) And they just, that made it through the editing bay? I'm sorry, you know, according to TikTok, I don't know. Uh, (laughs) Maybe it's 2020. There's also that funny moment in the hearing where, oh, I can't can't remember which congressman it is, but he's, he, uh, he says, and again, that's tic tac, not tic tock. I had to tell my daughter that. And she told me, okay, boomer. Yeah, so that Chinese <laughs> communist website, it's uh, it's the can. That's he said Chinese <laughs> communist website. Um, but yeah, so this was not by any means a hostile hearing. You know what I mean? Like the um the members of Congress, the House representatives, the witnesses, their supporters giving their testimony. There's not a lot of um you uh what's that movie with Tom Cruise and Jack Nicholson? You can't a few handle good men. a few good men. There's you not can't a handle the truth. Yeah. There's not a few good men situation here. It, it does sound like they're all working together to try to find some solutions to these things because there are dangerous implications. The first most immediate dangerous implication is that the U S public is paying for something and has been paying for something for decades with no oversight, no checks or balances which means that there will inevitably be mission creep. The second implication, of course, national security threat, not just for the U.S., but for everybody. And then we have to give some air for the, for the scientist because Grush does have a degree in physics. But these guys are also, again, um, a thing that I at least I have immense respect for them on. I think it speaks to their character. They're not making claims that they feel they cannot support. And they're not saying they have answers when they don't. They're not claiming to be um, academics. They're not claiming to, you know, be the world expert on material science or whatnot. But there haven't been scientists publicly talking about analyze the, the, an analysis of these physical things, whether they be craft or whether they be, 
non-human biologics. And then there's also the inevitable recursive thing with social media. There are a lot of people saying, what if this is bread and circuses? What if this is smoke and mirrors? What if this is a distraction from other very clear and very provable dangerous things? Mm. Yeah, like uh, global boiling. How about that one? That's a fun one. Well, yeah, that's and directed energy weapons from Antarctica. <laughs> you love that pyramid, huh? <laughs> Dude. That got a little shiver there. I like it. That thing, I don't know. That stuff's weirding me out. I've been going down that rabbit hole while I've been on uh, beach time. It's just like, mm -hmm. what is this one kilometer by one kilometer by one kilometer optical thing that can send signals? <clears throat> okay, cool. Everything's fine. Uh, but, uh, but really, to when you're talking about that, Ben, it makes me think of that Whitest Kids You Know sketch that we've mentioned before where there's an official White House briefing and it's about the bears uh, from space and Mars that are all like working with cartels and we think they might be uh, joining up with some kind of wizard faction. And then one of the people in the audience says, hey, I have a question. Just shot in the dark. Are we invading Iran today? Yes. And the guy yeah, giving yeah, yeah. the briefing is like, yeah, you got me. Yeah, yeah, you got me. <laughs> you know, I really like that show. And it's an absolute shame that Trevor Moore passed away so young. Um, absolutely it is a shame. It, 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 but that is a bummer for sure. It is nice to see um, the one guy uh, whose name I'm totally forgetting go on to make an amazing horror film in Barbarian. What's that guy's name? Oh, well, there's Timmy Williams. There's Zach Kreger. Zach Kreger is the barbarian mm -hmm. guy. Yeah. He's barbarian following in the, in the great footsteps of, uh, of Jordan Peele. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The only thing really differentiating horror and comedy is the sound design. So uh, we have to ask ourselves, look, there's still a bunch that hasn't been answered yet. And of course, we want to thank these three men for coming forward in good faith and perhaps at... Um, personal and professional risk for sure. I want to thank everybody who is objectively investigating this, who is advocating for a reporting process. And we have to ask, what does this mean for now? I mean, it, it, it shows us uh, the hearing appears to be a step for true believers. It's a monumental step toward the greatest discovery in human history. Uh, for the skeptics, this is a monumental step in political theater, maybe, for those who believe it's a distraction. And at the very least, it does appear that the armed forces uh, must acknowledge and investigate anomalous sightings on the part of their personnel and avoid retaliating against them. I mean, I don't know. Also, what a kicker. What We said this before. I said this before. It's classic human. Can you imagine we discover real non-human intelligent civilization just as our world is burning down and then what we try to move, twist. yeah we try to move in with them too quickly and take it long term like hey it's great to meet you <laughs> that'll <laughs> definitely end well uh, our, our place i'm sure we will outstay our welcome or anything <laughs> right. like that you know? who gets to go and they're like oh man 115 this is perfect oh no <laughs> that's fahrenheit <laughs> uh yeah so yeah. let us know, folks. Let us know when you tuned into the hearing what you thought about this. Uh, let us know what you see as coming next down the line. Because, of course, nothing happens in a vacuum unless it happens in outer space. Okay, last time. Or a vacuum, you know, when you're, like, <laughs> clean, clean it up. Oh, wow. Gosh, in the words of my new best friend, Burchett, guys, thank you for being here, brother. <laughs> I'm just I'm just tickle pink to be here. That's what I say. I do declare. And if you would like to make your declarations about this episode, we want to hear from you. Join up. We try to be easy to find online. Correct. You can find us at the handle conspiracy stuff on uh X. Yeah, I'm not gonna call it that. Twitter, uh, YouTube, and Facebook conspiracy stuff show on Instagram. Is the new URL x.com? Is that a thing? Or is it yeah, Twitter? It sounds like a really raunchy dating site. No, I'm being serious. Is it x. Yeah, I think Twitter probably Twitter probably redirects, but okay. yeah, it's it's x.com. 
Wow. All right. Ah, so much can happen. Short time. Uh, you can call us 1-833-STDWYTK. It's a voicemail system. You get three minutes, say whatever you'd like, give a cool nickname, and let us know if we can use your message and voice on the air. If you got more to say that can fit in that three minutes, why not instead send us a good old-fashioned email? We are conspiracy at iheartradio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.